World War I and subsequently World War II were highly chaotic and experimental times for our species overall. As conflict spread across the planet, it would continue to highlight a strange pattern within our species. The unfortunate benefit about war is, medically, technologically, socially, and in general, it pushes our species to innovate with the sole purpose of destruction and, in some cases, advanced technology to deal with destruction. While the Second World War would usher in a form of destruction that was considered to essentially be the power of the gods, World War I would see its own horrors created. Always remember, while the Germans created the gas, which was considered a war crime, they got mad at the US for developing a pellet thrower and went on to complain about it being inhumane in the trenches. Like, bro, what? Y'all were literally using, like, lung melters. But that was a time and a half ago, so back to my regular rambling. In an effort to remain a sovereign nation and not have arguably, depending on who you talk to, the Allied powers inadvertently possibly trigger World War II through horrific inflation, giving rise to one of the largest tools in the universe, a base would be constructed in the Argonne Forest with the purpose of creating a way to hit back at the Allies and diminish their ability to fight. Within these dugout trenches turned rooms, experiments would be conducted on a mystery disease that they were hoping could be dropped into enemy lines and start turning the tide of battle, considering it appeared that everything was starting to wrap up for the Germans and that they would actually be pushed back. However, what they created would get quickly out of hand, which would result in a complete abandonment of the base. As they realized they needed to go back and destroy the evidence, otherwise it would result in charges being levied against individuals that were still alive and who worked there, they would then head back in an attempt to cover it up. But as luck would have it though, you know, bad luck that is, at that exact point, a team of Americans, USA baby, British, and a single Canadian were being sent in to find out why this base was constructed so far behind front lines and what they were trying to hide. Sent in as a simple reconnaissance mission, they would accidentally release something that if it got out would balloon past the various sides engaged in conflict and might even go on to become a species-wide event concerning the human population. But what is this disease and how does it impact human behavior? Well, I know it's big sad boy hours, but I must tell you, it's not rabies. I know you're crushed, me too, but it's still highly interesting as I have a pretty good idea as to what this actually is, or at least the organism that it hails from. So let's discuss today the parasite in Trench 11 and figure out neurologically how it impacts the brain the way it does. But first, this episode is sponsored by Incogni. Going to incogni.com forward slash Roanoke and using code Roanoke, you can get an exclusive offer of 60% off, or you can just use the link below. So you're sitting there thinking about ordering some donuts when all of a sudden you see an ad for donuts. It's creepy, isn't it? Humans are pattern-based creatures. It's what we do. And because of that, you have a very specific pattern that you exhibit online to make you more predictable. Companies have long since picked up on that and used that to their advantage to advertise directly to you. Companies collect, aggregate, and trade your personal data all without you knowing, making the donut ad seem almost like it was mind reading, when in reality, it's using your data online to figure out more about you. You would have to write in individually to have this information deleted, but it would take years for you to track down all that data. So have Incogni do it for you to protect your privacy and take your personal data off the market by reaching out to these data brokers on your behalf where a request for its removal can be made and they can also deal with their objections. It's weird how they can actually object at all. Most companies hold on to things like your actual name, email, home address, gender, phone number, and like many, many other points to map out you and your spending habits. How does this happen? Let's say that you subscribe to a newsletter and now get like a ton of spam mail. Well, that's definitely me. Or maybe you just read the news about some big company's data breach. Congrats, your information is now being sold online. Joy bound. So if you want to get your personal data off of a data broker's hard drive, then by heading to incogni.com forward slash Roanoke and using code Roanoke, you can get 60% off or click the link below and take your personal data off the market. All right, let's get back to it. Hello everyone. I don't usually make appearances on my channel except for the like hundreds of shorts if you've seen those. Uh, I just want to let everybody know I will be at PAX West uh, in... August. So I'll see you there. And apart from that, I appreciate everybody watching. Thank you for checking out this video. If you like it, please subscribe. And if you hate it, make sure you unlike it or dislike it. That way it gets interaction either way. We're good to go. All right. Thanks. We arrive at the Western Front in France in 1918, where not only were there German-created parasites looking to take over the planet, but British parasites as well, looking to make colonel in the final days of the conflict, not caring uh, who or what they threw into danger or in the meat grinder. And this is already sounding like the worst magic school bus episode of your life. It's 78 feet underground. Come along, class, before the Germans detonate the charges above. 
This episode really is getting worse and worse. A man is crawling through with a flashlight along with another man who is setting charges to blow the place. They think the Germans are above setting a trap for them as apparently they are trying to get out of there. As one man starts crawling through one of the hallways, he approaches one of the Germans who is laying on the floor. And I can't show you any of that here, but I can show you on a site called Rumble. I upload uncensored versions of the videos there if you are interested. It's under Roanoke Gaming. I'd love to do that here, but unironically, I like paying my mortgage as well. Anyhow, he awakens one man who immediately screams as he's alerted the Germans are above them. As he does, though, the Germans then set off their charges, burying them all. Heading over to HQ Battalion, the Brits meet up with their general to discuss the strange compound the Germans built, 11 miles from the front lines in the Argonne Forest. It is four levels deep, and a German scientist by the name of Reiner is there. This makes them rather concerned, given that Reiner has been instrumental in creating quite a few screwed up concoctions to be used against the Allies. They are given the go-ahead to go in there and figure out just what exactly he's working on, and then to destroy the place. They are sent in to find if he's possibly using anthrax, or bubonic plague, or anything else which he's already been shown to kind of turn into countermeasures prior. The general then says that their escort is American, which they object to, like, okay bro. Not like we aren't the powerhouse of the entire planet. By the way, welcome to the channel, we're violently pro-American here. Also, for your information, uh, just so you're aware, bubonic plague never actually went anywhere. I've mentioned this before, but it's sort of like being a youngling back in the day when you were knee-high to a grasshopper, like you used to have somebody that picked on you, then you went to high school, started lifting, and then they just kind of became a non-issue. That's humanity with antibiotics, really. Every few years or so, even in the US, there's an outbreak of bubonic plague as someone gets infected by like a squirrel, but it's typically dealt with using antibiotics, and it's treated fairly easily. Now, the alarming part of this is, first, because it hasn't gone anywhere, all it's really doing is just waiting. And I mean, I'm personifying it, but for our society, if it were to break down, it could create another major outbreak of this stuff. But it's also becoming antibiotic resistant to what we have currently, as there was actually a outbreak of antibiotic resistant bubonic plague in Madagascar a few years ago, just prior to the respiratory disease that kind of took hold of the planet for a while. I said it then, and I'll say it again. The actual outbreaks they don't tell you about are the actual bad ones. Just remember that. As a former scientist myself, having worked with diseases, yeah, it's not good out there. Uh, but you'll never hear about it, and that's probably for the best. So as we meet our tunneler, he just uh, hooked up with a French girl, and he's drinking in her parents' house. Very good. This man is exhibiting just alpha chat American behavior, although he is Canadian. Also, World War I, French girls. Gonorrhea is almost incurable at this point. Like, quite literally, antibiotics work on the precedence that you take it over the course of its completion, and it annihilates all bacteria. If you stop because you feel better, all you've done is left the strongest gonorrhea that wasn't destroyed, and now it's resistant. Finish your antibiotics for the love of God. Remember that. So they have a conversation about who seduced who. He talks about how he can't wait for her to meet his parents. He'll take her back to Winnipeg, and it's more romantic than Paris. Bro, I'm pretty sure at this point, Ohio is more romantic than Paris. She gives him a look, and uh, now they say Papa Roanoke has like a bad time reading women's expressions. I don't know who they are. But I have no idea if she's actually enthused to meet his parents or excited for the war to be over so he can go back to Canada and she can stay in France. I honestly don't know. The face doesn't look that excited though. So the toddler then gets grabbed by soldiers and is brought on duty as the group then begins their trek across the frozen area of France. They arrive at the forest edge as already the Americans are not enjoying the leadership of the Brits, remarking that this was the first war in a hundred years and the Brits are on the American side. Classic. Old rivalries just never die. The Americans are also just straight up popping white girl at this point to stay awake. I can't say what it actually is because I'll be hit with a yellow marker of doom. They're talking about the Tunnler, however, as he dug himself out of the ground for 12 days. Everyone assumed he was already a goner, like his family had already planned his funeral and were attending it, but somehow he survived. And then he was sent straight back into the suck. Now he's just heavily relying on the bottle day to day to make it through. It's probably a good sign of things to come. The group's break then wraps up as they move into the forest before spotting the structure. The Americans are sent in first, completely tweaking on stimulants, or as they call it, forced march, and enter the compound. As they do, they meet no resistance. The place is completely abandoned. Using that sweet, sweet trench pellet thrower, though, they follow a trail of blood to a pile of complete blur. Whoa! Why would the Germans blur out their own bodies? This is so dumb. Meanwhile, over at the German lines, a group of men are talking about what they left behind at the Wu-Tan compound. Or Wu-Tan. Pretty sure it's Wu-Tan. Like, W's are V's and V's are W's. The charges that they set fail to ignite. Or did they? We'll find out. And their concern is also that they will be found out. Reiner begins talking about how everyone but him is essentially stuck in the past, wanting honorable war, and he's the only one pushing forward. Hmm, nice job, bro. We really needed you to do that. A+. Plus. But it doesn't matter. The guy who's in charge basically tells him they need to go back and destroy everything. No souvenirs. Otherwise, once this thing draws to a close, sentences are going to be handed out like jello shots at a frat party. 
which none of them want. That being said, a jello shot doesn't actually sound too bad right now. Back at the trenches, they find German shells being used on the German blur pile, which is a little strange as you might imagine. Basically, this is comparable to finding badass elite units all KIA by plasma scoring. Friend of yours? But much like with the elites, the Americans and Germans just met. Essentially, this caused the team some concern as it is completely out of character for Fritz to just kind of get rid of their own people, so what was going on? The team then heads in and discusses what they should do to continue just in case the Germans come back, which has been known to happen before, but then it turns into a bit of an argument. The Tunneler warns them that the Germans are known to leave traps for farm boys looking for trophies, so don't touch anything as they all descend into the lower section. Looking around, it looks like everyone left in a hurry, which is usually a good sign, right? <laughs> Wrong! They then begin their sweep of the area as the tunneler finds a sealed door. Looking around, they spot a meat suit on the ground. This one does not appear to have any lead holes in it, instead, just surface damage. The tunneler continues working on the sealed door as they check the German's hands. They are bloodied and broken as if he tried to climb out. As the work of the door continues, eventually he gets up and tells them not to open the door. He gets frantic trying to warn them, but he's speaking the wrong language and only one of them actually understands him. He keeps telling them how he had to wash for supper, but the Brits want to open the door anyways. He then turns and faces one soldier in particular who has his barrel trained on him as he literally grabs the end of it. Not a great situation to be in, but everyone just continues to ignore it. <laughs> what? That's not good. Like, if anybody grabs the end of your force multiplier, it's like everybody needs to get that thing away from him. I mean, you know, what if he Han wicks that thing out of your hands? As a soldier falls back yelling at him to step back, the German gets more excited about the prospect of being taken out. Eventually, the soldier acquiesces, and gives the Germans mines some fresh air. But again, it appears to be everything he wanted. Possibly infected? Let's discuss. So here's the thing about wanting to be taken out. It runs counter to typically how our brains work. While there are those that struggle with this issue, it's typically because there's a chemical imbalance within the brain itself that overrides self-preservation. Fix the chemical imbalance, fix the problem. Because of the German's interaction being completely strange in terms of willingness to go and being frantic as well as lying unconscious on the ground previously, we can go ahead and assume that behaviorally, he was altered to the point that logical thought was out the door. We will discuss this matter more in depth once we get a better understanding of what happens to the neurological function of a person as well as the pressures that are put on the brain as a result of the parasite. So after the fun encounter with the locals, they open up the door as Burton is directed to take lead by the British brass. Ah yes, very heroic, you lie me back. Walking along, they find blood on the walls about shoulder height and find nothing in there. Following a blood trail, eventually, Something attacks them as one man has his face thrown up on, which is my nightmare. This will be fairly important later as to explaining how the infection spreads. In this process, the infected pulls the pins on one of the grenades and he's able to get it off of his vest before it blows. And going back to being thrown up in the face, yeah, people's bodily fluids, like, it doesn't make me squeamish or, like, knock me out or anything. In fact, actually, I've seen some pretty bad wounds in my day. I've been bled on, I've been thrown up on, I'm pretty sure I've had other flu- well, that doesn't sound right. Basically, I've had people's bodily fluids It still doesn't sound right. It's phrasing, but it doesn't matter. It's all gross, right? The reason it freaks me out is because while I have a skin barrier, I don't really trust it, and I don't want what that other person has. It's just, it grosses, eh. Yeah, diseases in general, that's why I went into what I went into. Know your enemy. That was way off topic, but it doesn't matter. So the tunnel collapses, and that was their only known way out, so they start to panic a bit, because that means they can't escape. Which, uh, you have a limited amount of air, so panic is not really what you want to do. Besides, you can always just start digging, right? Now, probably not. You'd run out of air before you made it 12 feet, arguably. So the tunneler, however, knows there are usually more exits than one, and he can feel the air moving. This is known because, fun fact, having just one hole in the ground will not facilitate airflow into a compound. You need multiple so that air can go in and then move the carbon dioxide out. Walking along, they find another descending point, and the Brit asks if it was just shell shock, which makes the Americans laugh. See, the Americans had to fight hard for the Argonne Force in the first place, so they know what shell shock looks like. And what is shell shock? Well, there's actually a biological process, like with most traumatic stress disorders. Shell shock actually horrifically was known as cowardice back in the day. Uh, if a soldier couldn't perform, sometimes they were taken out because it was poorly understood what the issue was. We now know that it's PTSD or something known as battle or combat fatigue. The thing about humans is our bodies are designed to deal with stressors for a limited amount of time. When our body detects a stressful environment or situation, adrenaline will be released along with the activation of the sympathetic nervous system to remain alert and remain alive. In a limited time frame, this adaptation is highly useful as clearly it kept our ancestors alive. However, what humans experience now, we were never meant to deal with. All throughout history are examples of soldiers succumbing to the horrors of combat fatigue as their bodies are taxed beyond their ability to cope with it, which leads to the thousand yard stare, 
the inability to control emotions, tremors, fear, anxiety, and a constant state of mental alertness that wears down the body's coping mechanisms over time and has tremendous physical implications for the body itself. And the thing about it is, it's not a question of if, but a question of when you will develop this issue. It is known that humans will break mentally around 60 to 240 days, depending on the amount of battle that they see and what is witnessed in that time frame. Now, mental resilience does come into play, but you can take the most resilient person in the world and they can still crack. Even you, edgy teenager, about to comment on this video and say, well, that could never be me. I'm just built different. No, it is you because it's me and it's everybody you know, and it's all of us. We're not, <laughs> we're really not meant for this. But as cortisol levels shoot up and the sympathetic nervous system continues to kick it into overdrive, blood pressure will skyrocket, immune function will decrease, which coupled with sleeping issues will lead to night terrors as well as illness to spread throughout the entire trench, which can also lead to cognitive function to decline. If soldiers are not removed from combat to recover, this constant release of adrenaline will create issues in organ function and circulatory system disorders such as blood clotting issues. What is a survival function meant to help us exit a dangerous situation only leads to more issues if humans are left in a stressful environment for too long over great periods of time. It seems also that over time, due to the multi-system dysfunction brought on by many hormones flooding the body, this will greatly decrease a person's ability to mentally operate as well, which may or may not be fixed over time. There are a plethora of stories of soldiers actually returning home and reliving what they saw in combat as if they were still there. And because of this acknowledgement that humans are not machines, we are made out of meat, and as a result can be influenced by the environment around us, soldiers are typically cycled in and out or at least they are supposed to be. Combat fatigue and PTSD is no joke, and arguably we should be taking care of the people that served and are now suffering with these disorders rather than what we're doing now. So I know I'm on a soapbox, I'm just passionate about this stuff. Remember, it's not weakness, it's a biological function taken to exhaustion, leading to physiological consequences. In fact, if you are in the US and are a current or former service member struggling with any mental issues associated with what you have seen or experienced, you can call 1-800-662-4357 for help. I know this detracts from the usual feel of my videos, but it is important for people to know that there is help out there. But we're gonna move on. The Americans know that he's sick, which the Brit references as a form of super lethal influenza. And if I recall correctly, the Spanish flu was a thing around this time, which really was a form of super lethal influenza that I'm pretty sure the tally was actually 53 million people that dropped. And that was only like the reported ends. There was hypothesized really to be around 100 million, which also another horrible fact for you. The reason that it was called the Spanish flu is because the Spanish reported on it first, whereas countries who were trying to keep it quiet because they didn't want it to affect uh, morale towards the war may have caused more issues with that. So arguably that's probably why it got out of hand the way it did. But anyways, the Brits tell them that uh, don't worry if we don't report back at 0900, then a team of engineers will extract them. Hmm, yes, behind enemy lines in an enemy forest, down enemy lane in an enemy bunker. I'm sure they will. So the plan to escape has been set. Find one of the emergency shafts and GTFO. Finding it on the door, they come across hospital beds. That's never a good sign. They check the map on the table and then find a layout of the current German zombies map that they are on. They know that they need to get the power turned back on before the fetch me their soul dogs show up. Pretty sure I used that joke before. What is with all the German zombie movies now? Hmm. But of course these are infected, so maybe it's not the same thing, but they are 50% there. Also, I can't say their actual names because you would not see zombies in this video at all. <laughs> As they continue trying to explore the area, an attack is launched by the infected. The men are stronger than normal and more durable. However, they can absolutely be put down by standard means if you aim carefully enough. This indicates that they are very much so alive and reliant on their biochemistry as a means of survival, much like any other human would be. The parasite is not directing an unstoppable tank, but merely appears to be just altering the behavior to be more aggressive in some ways. As one of the Americans who's not a part of this fight goes to check out what's around, he finds some alcohol it looks like as one of the Germans then launches an attack of their own. He yells at him and it turns into some good old fashioned hand-to-hand -hand combat. And this shows another point of the fact that while they are aggressive, they are still in control somewhat. Their brains are operational, but clearly they are under the influence of something else. He's able to take him off of him as the others arrive and they see what they are dealing with. The skin is inflamed, indicating massive immune responses all over the body. The immune responses are actually sort of, well, it's, to be honest with you, it's pretty bad in humans. There's no way around it. Parasites are something our bodies struggle to clear and our bodies have actually gaslit themselves to the point that we need parasites. That's right. Longtime viewers of this channel will know this, but if you know, you're know you a newbie, it's one of the issues with colonizing another planet. Our bodies have been on this rock long enough that parasites have been incorporated into our very biological functioning. 
When we become infected with some parasites, because other parasites will just wreck us, our bodies will launch a response to the infection. Eosinophils, neutrophils, and white blood cells will find and attack the parasites in largely unsuccessful ways. This is not to say that our bodies cannot clear some parasites or create a barrier to, say, zoonotic infectious parasites, but for the most part, if it has adapted to humans, you aren't clearing it. Once the eosinophils have been launched and release their toxic substances, typically either this will lyse the parasite and it'll meet its end, or it won't work at all, and the body must now deal with the parasite in its midst. If this does happen, your body appears over time, due to your ancestors being infected, to have just said, nah, screw it. Friendship ended with non-parasite life. Me and tapeworm are best friends now. Now, obviously that's a joke. Tapeworms are not safe in the slightest, but your body will actually use parasites almost as a stabilizing factor for the body. Now, a quick thing about the parasites, a little sidebar, uh, especially with tapeworms, those can actually spread to other organs. They can spread to your brain, they can spread to your liver, they can spread to your lungs, they can spread to your heart, because the ones that are in your intestines will have babies and those will burrow through the intestinal wall and get into your circulatory system. So if you ever discover you have a tapeworm and you're losing weight, it's not a good thing. Anyhow, without these parasites that actually have been known to calm our immune systems by releasing chemicals, our bodies may actually overreact to small things. And this is why a growing support for the hypothesis of why allergies are increasing in first world countries is because none of us are infected with these parasites. Which brings us back to colonizing other worlds. We live on a rock where parasites are abundant, yet not all of us in first world countries get parasites, and if we do, we clear them with medication. Living on a literal fourth world like Mars, there are no parasites, at least that we know of, so would our immune systems continue to get more and more out of control and sensitive to everything around it? It is entirely possible. So to conquer this issue, we need to figure out how parasites affect our bodies and be able to replicate it. Otherwise, it is entirely possible within a few generations of living on Mars, those that are there may never return back to Earth because their allergies would send them into immediate anaphylactic shock. We are unironically going to need to bottle earth air like space balls and release it into the domes on mars and have people take parasite tablets to achieve similar immune responses as those on earth so a wound in his abdomen shows that there are worms coming out and this concerns everyone as they begin to wonder if they are infected spoiler the guy who got thrown up on is 100 infected which mega supports the idea of what i think these things are so back with the Tunneler and his escort, he got injured in the skirmish of their own, but he'll be all right for now. The Tunneler tells him Jennings, the Brit, is actually a liar. Nobody's coming for them. Meanwhile, over at German autopsy table, they crack him open like a Christmas turkey and find, much like an undercooked Christmas turkey, it's riddled with parasites. I don't know if that's true. I just thought it flowed. As they look at the worms that are all over his body, the doctor remarks how humans cannot contract these types of worms at this size or in this quantity. It's true, but we'll talk about what sort of worms these are soon. The worms have infiltrated his frontal lobe, his orbital cavities, and his sinuses. This makes the doctor think that this disease was engineered as clearly it's not natural. So here we get our first look at what is actually taking place with these parasites. Shortly after infection, they appear to spread all throughout the body, but more often, we will see later, they appear to end up in the digestive tract of humans. Upon entering the brain, which we'll discuss later as to why they end up here, the effects on the brain would be profound. Inundating the sinuses, they would then move towards the eyes and crawl behind the eyes, following the optic nerve into the brain. Structurally, this is why they appear in the areas that they do, and they appear to affect these areas more heavily. Some will head up to the frontal lobe, where clearly these worms being parasites and successful ones at that in humans would start eating some of the brain. This will begin to have an effect on the person, such as a lack of emotional control being present, splitting headaches, increased agitation, and lack of planning and forethought. I like to reference Phineas Gage when it comes to frontal lobe destruction because he had a very interesting, albeit morbid, case of essentially his frontal lobe being removed from uh, communication with the rest of his brain. Phineas Gage was a foreman back in the 1800s. Essentially, some dynamite went off too early and shot a spiked piece of metal through the underside of his jaw and out the top of his head. He would survive the hit, which, good lord, but it would cut off his frontal lobe from the rest of his brain. Essentially, previously, as the man was described, he was a great leader, had emotional control, and very level-headed. After this connection was severed, he was chaotic, emotionally oscillated between like yelling and crying and laughing. But actually, there is kind of a good outcome with this, because over time, due to neuroplasticity, he would recover some emotional control, but he was never the same again. However, he did survive and was still capable of communicating and understanding people. The amount of alterations to the mental functions just by the frontal lobe being altered is staggering. As the brain would be contending with worms, this would also change function of things like personality, as well as movement in some areas of the body, and this is why the infected are moving around unsteadily and jerkily 
but, if that's even a word, but also presents an interesting symptom, the strength increase. Our bodies are capable of a lot, and a lot more than you might imagine. And this is why you hear stories sometimes about a person unlocking strength in a life or death scenario that seems superhuman. The reason is our brains will limit the amount of strength that we are capable of using in order to protect our bodies from degradation. Typically, you will use only around 30 to 50% of your strength on average. With strength training, you can get up to around 60%, with elite level people unlocking around 70%, but it is never 100% of your strength being used. As the brain controls this output, it means that if anything affects that area of the brain, then output of that strength can essentially go unregulated. And this is why when the Germans are infected, they are stronger than normal. As the brain is impacted with the worms, their strength would increase, allowing them to tap into the ability without regulatory functions. And this would make it incredibly difficult for a person without proper leverage to overcome them. Now, you may be like, well, why don't we use 100% of our strength? The reason for this is you can literally tear bone away from muscle and break bones if you used 100% of your strength. So along with that strength, there appears to be anger. It'll be mentioned later, but that parasite will cause some to fornicate, some to drink, but most to fly into a blind rage to end those around them. And this would involve specifically the lower portions of the brain concerning the limbic system, specifically actually the amygdala, which if there's activation in this area, anger and fear are located here. So this might make them appear more angry and actually acting in anger. But we will focus on just sort of these two emotions. With the worms in this area, which the optic nerve also happens to pass this area of the brain, the worms would inherently be putting pressure on the amygdala, altering its functionality, likely pushing it to be overactive. Because of this, this would cause a person to stand next to another, and I'm gonna practice my German here, screaming Scheisse as he quite literally is in a blind rage before starting his attack. We see something very similar in those who receive concussions, which alters the brain function, or possibly even those who have received some form of brain damage, either in the frontal lobe or the lower portion of the brain. The worms in these areas would clearly be eating and placing pressure on the tissue around them. And because of the body launching an immune response, this was largely ineffective. We can surmise that likely the meninges have swelled, leading to meningitis, also giving reason as to why they are behaving and moving in the way that they are. So meanwhile, at the top of the compound, the Germans have arrived to clear it. The Tunnler and the American continue searching for a way out, as back at Hospital Bay, Jennings tells everyone to go as they are going to leave now, somehow. The Americans decline after witnessing this crap as a standoff in Sues. In the middle of them acting like a bunch of idiots though, they don't notice that player three has entered the game. The Germans have arrived with half their group now taken out, and then they just proceed to pretty much take out everybody else. Well that was stupid. Good job guys. The remaining are then rounded up by the German leaders as skirmishes they endured getting down there made them lose their tunneler and a few others as well. At this point the tunneler and the American do find their way out, but they decide to stay back after discussing it and go for the group, which is probably a bad idea because as they talk about morality, the Germans arrive and take them prisoner as well. And oh good, the power's back on. See, I told you to turn the power back on. Reiner is then informed about the prisoners as he tells his other counterpart, the men they lost in the fight to get down there. Reiner then also wants to continue working on his disease rather than destroying it, which means now we have a conflict of orders. Who could have seen that coming? Mueller at this point addresses the prisoners, asking who is the tunneler because he wants to contain the disease. So Mueller has good intentions, but Reiner has doucher intentions. Reiner then asks the British doctor, Dr. Priest, to come with them, which is never good, as the rest of the group goes with Mueller and his men. They're heading down two levels where the main charges fail to detonate. He tells them that if they do their job, they will be spared their lives, although Reiner basically said, get them to do their jobs and take them out. Heading down, they can hear the yelling of the men in the area as they attempt to be as quiet as possible. Meanwhile, in Reiner's office, the doctors discuss the ethics of creating the thing as Topic shifts over to him telling Reiner where the allies are mustering for their next attack. He says he doesn't know, which I imagine we all know how this is going to turn out. Reiner then tells him they're brothers in science. Don't know about that one, Chief. He mentions how science is only judged, good or bad, based on its effectiveness. Still don't know about that one, Chief. The doctor mentions how Reiner created an abomination, which Reiner objects. Still don't know about that. And then we finally hear what Reiner has done. Reiner's parasite is more virulent than normal. It can overwhelm a host in a matter of hours. Some fornicate, others drink, but most just lose their grip on reality and just want to take out anyone around them no matter what side they're on. Dropping this on the allies would supposedly be highly effective. So what does that mean when something is highly virulent? It's a word that I'm sure we all have heard recently. Essentially, it is severely harmful in its effects or bitterly hostile. Given what we know about how the parasite operates up until this point, I would tend to agree with this notion. But what he says also at the insult of Dr. Priest is he took livestock parasites and applied them to humans in a way, made them stronger and able to infect humans as well. Because not all parasites that infect livestock actually, actually do well in humans. So here's what we know. 
It's a brain-seeking parasite that likely consumes the brain to a degree as well. It alters the behavior of the host in several ways just by being present, making them more hostile in the process, but the ability to control the parasite is outside any means of the people who created it, and it has the ability to spread quite easily, as we will find out through bodily fluids. As the rest of the group then finds a man, the American with them gets taken out via nose bite and then neck bite, as Mueller then loses his force multiplier in the skirmish. He tells Burton that they need to focus on containing this as if it gets out, humanity is likely done. So the two agree to put their differences aside and deal with the issue at hand. Reiner at some point has had enough of the doctor and then switches tactics to just torturing him for information. Big oof. Imagine saying oof in 2023. Mueller and Burton have now found the charges. Mueller asks Burton if he is infected because he feels like concussively detonating the charges, which actually is a symptom of the infection. As Burton looks at it though, Mueller asks, well, what's wrong with them? And he sees nothing and says they were just disconnected. Somebody wasn't ready to say goodbye. It was Reiner. Of course it was. Mueller at this point then hands Burton a beer as they share it and discuss the prospect of war. And that's the thing about war. Typically it's just average people fighting at the direction of the people in charge. You get those average people together under a situation of not fighting or with like a common goal and the differences pretty much fall away. Ah, human nature. Isn't it pretty screwed? There's actually, uh, it's interesting. There was a truce called on Christmas back in World War One, where the sides went to no man's land after having just torn each other apart the previous day, played soccer, drank beer, hung out, and also it's soccer, not football, because American football is the real football, and then proceeded to tear one another apart again the next day. Absolutely wild. Burton mentions how after what both sides have done in the war, maybe we all deserve to be wiped out. Hey, we might do that to ourselves one day, you never know. As they then set up the charges with debt cord, they then run into gas being released into the compound, but they're able to outrun it before succumbing. Reiner continues working on his diseases like a complete turd, as Mueller and Burton then check the maps to find an exit before they blow the charges. Burton sets a timer for 45 minutes, but they need to run the debt cord up to the next level. As they talk about it, an infected man comes in and just straight up cleanly breaks Mueller's leg, but also breaks the timer in the process. Reiner gets his things together and then gets ready to leave. Mueller asks Burton if he can fix this as Mueller tells Burton to show him how to set off the charges, mainly because he's not going anywhere with a break that bad. Burton tells him how long to wait as Mueller gives him 28 minutes and Burton moves through setting debt cord as he can hear screaming of the infected as he attempted to move through quietly. Doing this, he already got spotted by one of the infected as it jumps on him, but interestingly, by cutting off oxygen, this causes the parasite to begin forcing its way out of the back of the eyes and exiting out of the nose. Man, practical effects are just so much better than CGI. As Mueller then checks his wallet and pictures, I hope that's not his son because he's just the right age to be drafted into World War II. Yeesh. Burton then, at this point, runs to the ladder to get out as Reiner finds him and pops him in the leg. He asks what he's even doing here as this isn't his war. He then shoots him in the hand and then starts gloating because of course he does. But as he does, Mueller detonates the charges, causing a cave-in, and in the ensuing instability, Burton is able to take out the guard and then go after Reiner. As they fight, Reiner gets a vial to the eye and then, like literally in the movie, hilariously starts crying. And then he's just taken out by a cave-in. Burton then crawls his way up to the surface as he's not about to be buried again, well, not completely anyways, as this would have been the most annoying climb of your life. Lots of dirt in your eyes. As he gets out onto the surface, he begins limping along in minimal clothing at a very low rate of speed. That doesn't bode well for the old survivability in hostile territory in the freezing cold factor. But with the mission completed, the worms have been stopped, and now he gets to go back to his French woman in an era before deodorant and armpit shaving. Well, we're arguably still in that era with the French. Tough break. So the question on everyone's mind, I can already hear it, is what exactly is this parasite? So first, we know it can infect a person through the digestive tract juices of an infected person. It appears to use a circulatory system to this end to get to the head and infect the person through the sinuses into the orbital cavities following the optic nerve, though a case could be made that it is using the circulatory system and this will have profound impacts on behavior. And finally, we know that this parasite is a worm obviously, and a helminth at that. The creature known as nomadomorpha, or the Gorsia worm, these worms are thread-like and have very specific life cycles, as well as excel in altering the behavior of hosts. Their typical target are insects that live near water, and they will start as eggs, which are incredibly small, like I think 40 microns across. After hatching, they will then be free swimming and then attach themselves and enter insects, where they will reach adulthood. One of the interesting things is they will direct the insects to unnaturally move closer to the water, 
where they could be like a target of fish, but mostly so that they can lay their eggs. Now, the interesting aspect about this is, is that the horsehair worm typically are non-compatible with humans. If you are infected, so to speak, you aren't really infected. They will typically land in your digestive tract. They may even hatch where kind of your physiology is non-compatible with theirs. An immune response will be launched and is largely effective, and this would create possibly abdominal discomfort, but nothing really needs to be done. Your body will clear this parasite. This version that Reiner created is clearly a new variant. It enters the human body by bodily fluid exchange as seen when Kelly gets thrown up on and succumbs later. Now, what might actually be helping these eggs kind of get past the immune response and it being largely not effective is because of the constant stress everyone is under, the immune function would be decreased, and this parasite had an easier time adapting to human physiology under the experimentation of Reiner. Once it became adapted, he kept working on it with these successful species along with the same lines as us domesticating wolves into dogs, except instead of taking the most docile, he took the most successful, kept breeding them until he had a version that would overwhelm a host in a matter of hours, along with likely thousands of eggs being laid in a person at once. These eggs would quickly hatch and enter the larval stage, where they would likely enter the bloodstream via the digestive tract, and then enter the brain, sinuses, muscles. Basically, as soon as you pop someone open, they ooze worms immediately. The worms appear reliant, however, upon the operational status of the human body. If oxygen is cut off for an extended period of time, they will exit the body in order to breathe. This is shown when Burton chokes out one of the infected as they immediately begin exiting the face in order to facilitate their own metabolism. The nutrition is clearly coming from the body itself as the worm is clearly parasitizing the Homo sapiens meat suit. This indicates to me that, as I have mentioned throughout, the brain is under attack, which eventually would render a person in a comatose state unless aroused by an outside influence, such as with that one soldier who was telling the allies not to open the door. So the next question is, how do you overcome this? Well, due to the aggression, but the absolute reliance on the human metabolism to keep the worms alive, it would be really easy if you just had like a force multiplier of putting down infected. The spread would likely be minimal as it would appear eggs are required to enter the body. The infection process would only be as effective as its ability to use a large scale plan to administer the eggs, which, I mean, I'm not saying people wouldn't be infected, but the parasite is slow even if they can overwhelm you in a few hours. Viruses and bacteria are much faster because of how they spread and their vectors. And honestly, the parasite wouldn't be too difficult to deal with. Would it be alarming? Yes. Could it get in the water supply? Yes. But once it was discovered, medication could probably be used. In fact, there are two medications that are used to treat this infection and manage the symptoms. The treatment is kind of a choice of diethylcarbamazine, which actually kills the adult worms. Uh, then you got albendazole, and sometimes it's used in patients who are not cured with multiple deck treatments. Uh, it's thought to actually also take out the adult worms. But my humble opinion, this is uh, almost a non-issue. Is it messed up? Absolutely. But Reiner would have to be limping to the barn if he thinks this would really spread that much, because as soon as it was discovered, immediate countermeasures against it would be launched. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, then leaving a like would be awesome. A view and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. I'll drop my Roanoke Tales channel link where last week we talked about the vanishing of the USS Cyclops and the Bermuda Triangle. Also drop my Twitter, Discord, and Patreon for all those interested. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, I'd like to thank our new astronaut, Rosie Kinks. I think that's how I pronounce it. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Death Dancer, as well as our scientists, Chad W., Logan Satome, Lucian Dragon, and Tyson Nakanishi. Thank you guys as well for your awesome support. And to the rest of my patrons, obviously, thank you. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running and keeping this channel up. It is greatly appreciated. But, all right, that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I will see you all in the next one.